Need bites for the game? Ran out of time to go to the store? Barstool Bites has you covered. Now available in select locations, your favorite Barstool bloggers are bringing an amazing assortment of game day favorites, must-have munchies, and anything in between. Dip into Feidelberg's Saturdays are for the dip, or bite into a part in my biggie sandwich. Barstool Bites, food made with stoolies in mind. Download the Barstool Bites app or order online at barstoolbites.com. Revely, revely, revely. <laughs> Friday edition of Zero Blog 30. You will notice this is the voice of Kate because Chaps is out. He's in San Diego for the Marine Corps ball. He actually FaceTimed me last night with one of my old sergeants, which was awesome. I hadn't seen her in years, so that was really, really cool. You know, it's funny. Uh, I was thinking before when you initially told us that, I was like, I wonder how they made the connection that, you know, Chaps would have Kate's phone number. And then I realized that'd be a pretty stupid thing to say. Yeah, and it was. Uh, I'm obviously also joined by Captain Cons and our producer, Nick. We hope the Nanas are doing well on this beautiful Friday. Nonas. The Nonas. Yeah, we hope they're crushing it. Uh, round number one, Channing Tatum is doing a movie, this is the word on the street, about the Afghan withdrawal that literally just happened two seconds ago. People are saying too soon. Round number two, if you've ever been to the tomb of the unknown soldier, you know how moving it is. And we've got a story about DNA advances and identifying the remains of, I didn't realize there's tens of thousands still of unidentified soldiers from all the different conflicts. Round number three, Michigan's attorney general is facing a public hangover after booze and a little too much at a tailgate. Who among us? Who among, Who among, us, among us, us is right? Who Amen. Among us is right? Round four, Chaps has an interview with a POW from the Iran-Contra affair. It is an absolutely remarkable story with a remarkable person. And then round number five, I'm just making save rounds around. It's Friday. We're going to make it quick. It's Veterans Day week. It's Marine Corps Ball week. We're, we're all worse for wear. So we're going to roll through it and hop right into round number one. And we're hopping into round number one with a toasty mug of Black Rifle Coffee. They have continually committed to supporting veterans, law enforcement, and first responders' causes. In 2020, they donated more than 6 million cups of coffee to deployed soldiers, law enforcement, and medical workers through their signature buy a bag, give a bag initiatives. They import their high quality coffee beans from all over the world and roast five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee and Salt Lake City, Utah. I've said it before, but I picture this, this sweet little cabin where they're just roasting those beans at Black Rifle Coffee Company. I just, I love it. I picture they're up in the Smokies. Anyway, uh, <laughs> The best way to enjoy Black Rifle Coffee is to join their coffee club. You pick your perfect roast, how much, and when you want delivered to your door, and they take care of the rest. It's free to sign up, and you get free shipping, discounts on partner brands, and early access to new products and club-exclusive products. Go to blackriflecoffee.com slash zero and use code zero today to get the freshest coffee in America shipped to you. Again, I have been living off their canned coffees, their iced coffees. It's getting mm -hmm. a little cooler out, but that hasn't stopped me at work. I always reach in the fridge at the end of the day because we have them stacked there. And I'm like, I just got to, I need these to keep some stuff cold in my bag, you know? And I, <laughs> I roll home You're with something ridiculous. Me you yeah. make it seem like we're not allowed to do that, which we very much are. And you think you're doing something wrong when in fact you are absolutely allowed to take anything and everything home. But the amount of these Black Rifle coffees I'm taking is, is maybe extreme. I have a cooler backpack, so. Yeah, but if, <laughs> but if you don't, nobody else will, you know, necessarily. Like, you know, it's only so many people in the office. Somebody's got to drink them, so I think it's okay. Well... Honey, speaking of coffee beans, mm. some people in Hollywood are getting roasted right now. Oh, that was good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, from James Clark at Task and Purpose, you know what we really need now, right at this moment, as the United States grapples with the aftermath of its 20-year war in Afghanistan, before we even have a complete picture of what happened in the final days of the withdrawal, a movie. Yes, that's what we need, a goddamn movie about it. Go off, James Clark. According to Deadline, actress Tom Hardy and Channing Tatum are attached to an unnamed war drama about the chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in which they'll star as former special operations soldiers who return to the country to aid in the evacuation of Afghan civilians from Kabul's besieged airport. The pitch by the Bourne Ultimatum screenwriter My God, it's Jason Bourne. Did I nail it? You nailed it. Holy calzones, it's Jason Bourne. Yo, dog, is that Jason Bourne? Hey, is that 
Anyway, uh, screener, screenwriter George Nolfi was described by Deadline as a ripped from the headlines fact-based drama about the Afghanistan evacuation. Details about the project are scarce, and the U.S. withdrawal has remained a focus focus of intensive reporting in recent months, which a major focus on what happened at the airport, as we know, a a horrific end, really, a lot of people lost their lives. And so I, I was shocked to see like, I wasn't I was shocked. But I also as the withdrawal was happening, and you know, you had the Pineapple Express guys and all sorts of other people going in getting people out, you say to yourself like this is it seems like a movie. And so obviously people in Hollywood thought that too and jumped right on it. Some of the work like rescuing American civilians and Afghan allies from the Taliban controlled country continues today, which sheds light on a potential problem with the film, especially if it's going to play up the fact-based angle. There's still a lot we don't know and there's still a lot going on. And wars don't just end when officials say they do, not for those who fought in them. They take years to process and America's longest war just came to a close this is my thing. Like are viewers ready for that story or are you a little tuckered out on it? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I I think it definitely needs more time to settle and everyone to come to grips with how they feel about everything. I think there are, there are a few things wrong from, from my perspective. Number one is the timing. I I definitely think it's too soon. And, And granted, you know, even if you, take the whole timeline of how a Hollywood movie gets made and, and getting the money, getting the funding, doing the production, da, 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 da. Even if that was fast and it was like, ha- this happens in a year, two years, I think that's still too soon. So the timing of it is, is definitely uh, off in my opinion. And then number two, based on this premise here, they're talking about the special forces operators who went back and, and you know did their own thing. And I think that's selling everybody else short that, that, that did so much of the dangerous work, all the troops at the airport. And, and, you know, that's a very hard story to tell, to tell the story of so many individuals who contributed to safely getting all of those people evacuated from the country. And it, it almost feels to me, now don't get me wrong. I love me some Channing Tatum, love me some Tom Hardy. As we all know, I did work with Tom Hardy on uh, the one Batman movie. That's another story for another day. But I think it's it's almost going to want to try to paint them in the, as these superhero s type people. And it almost might over-dramatize everything that happened. And in doing so, cheapen the efforts by all the other soldiers, airmen, and everybody else who had a hand in the Afga- uh, Afghanistan withdrawal. I just feel like how many movies can we make where we make a... Uh hot Hollywood guy, a special forces guy who goes and does something cool. Like, I feel like, but I mean, obviously it's a ticket for success because it's, it must be working if they keep doing it. Um, But I wonder, is there a scene where maybe they go a little magic Mike trying to distract the Taliban, you know, that could be, there could be some sassy angles to it, but generally like apocalypse now platoon full metal jacket, they came out at the end of the seventies and then later in the eighties, so people need sometimes a little time. Like if you came out with a movie right now about the pandemic or Dr. Fauci, I throw up on my fucking shoes. Yeah, I, it's too soon. I don't want to see it. I'm over saturated with it right now. And I, I need some time to like process it all and look at it because too, time gives you a different perspective on things too. I think absolutely a better perspective. So anyway, um, hopefully this is not going to be a new hurt locker. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. what they're saying. I mean, <laughs> the one that they, they do point out and, and we interviewed uh, a couple of, Uh, soldiers that were the basis of the movie, the outpost, uh, you know, the battle in in Afghanistan. And and I think that was an exception. I thought that movie was well done, but even that, I I have to imagine some of the folks that were in and around that operation, that would have been very heavy for them to relive so soon. Um, It just, it just seems like, and this should come as a shock to nobody, but this just feels like a big time money grab from Hollywood. And they're trying to capitalize on everything that's happening. And honestly, if you throw Channing Tatum and Tom Hardy at a project, people are going to jump at it. So yeah, I don't know. It kind of makes me a little upset, not maybe even more than just a little. It definitely makes me upset that we are, I mean, everything is still warm from everything that happened and, and already there's these talks. So I, uh, I'm not overly excited about this movie. And normally I would be with anything with these guys. And obviously there's plenty of great war movies and military movies that we're fond of, but I don't think this is the time. Yeah, unless the film benefits the actual Afghans in some way that are coming yeah. over here or something, then I'm kind of I'm out. Count me out on it for now. Right, right. 
or unless they turn it into a rom-com, you know, mm. then maybe I'm listening. I got my, uh, not, perhaps not. Perhaps Round number not. Two, perhaps not. Perhaps not. Round number two. Round number two is brought to us by my favorite hiking boots right now, Rocky boots. I have been wearing them for a couple years now. They've been our sponsor for a little bit for, and uh, I absolutely love them. The first time I wore them, I always braced myself to get blisters, did not get blisters. So I pretty pleased with that. Go to rockyboots.com, enter the code ZBT at checkout for 25% off your next pair. Rocky builds boots for men and women who serve and protect our country. Yeah, they have all sorts of different boots. If in the military, they have the military grade boots that they're officially within the standards. They also have hiking boots. They have all sorts of stuff. Uh, Chaps wears the steel toe for when he's working out in the tool shed. They work side by side with the Marine Corps. The USMC Tropic boot is very compliant, made in the US of A. So not only does Rocky make the best boots for our service members, they make awesome boots for the times between deployments and service. So whether you need boots for rucking in the desert, working in the yard, or getting outside this summer, they've got you covered. Go to rockyboots.com, enter the code ZBT at checkout for 25% off your next pair of boots, bringing us in, hiking us into round number two. You have, have Nick, have you been to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington Cemetery? I have not. No, you, uh, cons, you have, I'm sure. No, actually, I haven't. I, I've really? Never been to Arlington, yeah, that is that's something, Whoa. something I, I need to do. Absolutely. I've only been twice, once when I was a kid and then went by myself just a few years ago. And it was incredibly moving now that I've served going to the, the sections where the Iraq and Afghanistan members are buried and where, I mean, it was just really highly recommend everybody take the time to go. But one of the most moving parts is the tomb of the unknown soldier. It's almost at the perfect geographic center of the cemetery. And the tomb exemplifies valor and honor by remembering those who died committing brave and selfless acts with no one to bear witness to them. I think a lot of people think that there's someone buried in that there's multiple or people buried in that tomb. Right. Um, So 23 years ago, then Defense Secretary William Cohen publicly pondered whether any American wood fighter or fighter would ever again need to be buried as unidentifiable. This came after DNA testing conclusively identified the remains lying in the tomb of of, he was a Vietnam War veteran. First Lieutenant Michael Blassie, a 24 year old Air Force flyer shot down May 11th, 1972 in South Vietnam. So he was the last one in the tomb. And now the tomb represents a greater, just everyone who is unidentified. Mm -hmm. Almost a quarter century later, DNA technology has only gotten better and no American service member killed in action the last 30 years has been buried unknown. But people are starting to wonder now, well, could we go back then? So like the aftermath of World War II, there's roughly 8,500 American troops recovered, but deemed unidentifiable. Hmm. And so there's still families out there who don't, have that closure about their grandfather or their um so people are wondering if if things can be exhumed and developed and whatever and is it worth it or is it you know um so i just thought that was really interesting at arlington there are over four thousand unknown soldiers from the civil war Um, fighters from the north and south sometimes carried little way in identification often not even wearing a uniform or insignia if you were killed in the battlefield you had a pretty good chance of not being identified during the Civil War just by the nature of combat. Uh, U.S. warfighters first began wearing dog tags in World War I, a practice that became widespread throughout World War II. But even that system wasn't foolproof because people would trade dog tags, they would pick them, they would get picked off, they'd, they'd do all sorts of things. Friends, if you believe in UFOs, you better believe the key to getting in shape is 80% diet related. DBT supports all military servicemen and women, active and veteran. Your most important tool in life is your body and trifecta helps you take care of that. So it's not just going to the gym. You can go to the gym. You can PT all you want. You need to be using your diet too. Trifecta's in-house registered dietitian used to serve as the dietitian for the Navy SEALs. So, you know, it's legit. If she made the SEALs perform at their peak, she can make you perform at your peak playing call of duty. You don't have to suffer to eat healthy, convenient, save time rather than having to spend hours prepping every week. And there's science-backed nutrition. All of Trifecta's meals follow scientific nutritional principles. Food quality is their priority. Fresher food, farm to fork supply chain, never frozen organic produce, fully cooked food. No wasting your time cooking or cleaning, just heat and get healthy. Shop meal plans and get 40% off the code trifectanutrition.com. I know for me, that was one of the hugest things, especially 
when I was super exhausted in the beginning and I didn't have any time at all to cook with the baby, but I wanted to eat healthy. I wanted to be healthy. I, that is trifecta is you pop it in, you heat it up and everything's good. Uh, so definitely promo code zero trifecta nutrition.com. So wait, is this story telling me that they're going to go into the tomb and just start identifying remains or like what's going on here? It's that, so people are saying like, they're just wondering now that we have all this, all this different way to handle DNA, like, could we go back through and identify more people? Um, so for example, DPAA recently concluded a multi-year project to exhume and identify 388 soldiers and Marines buried as unknown from the battleship USS Oklahoma, which was destroyed obviously during the Pearl Harbor attack. The agency identified many of the remains, which had been badly burned and commingled through DNA testing, but a handful are slated to be buried once again as unknowns next month, because in some cases, comparative samples from next of kin could not be found because this also takes identifying all these remains also takes like, especially the older wars, there's really no hope now, but you need next of kin to do such a thing. And you need people who still don't. It's just really interesting. I I guess I just, I guess I had no idea how many unknowns there were out there. And another thing that hurts this cause in July of 1973, a fire broke out at the national personnel records center in St. Louis, which had uh, the blaze destroyed records of about 18 million veterans including 80% of army personnel discharged between 1912 and 1960, 75% of air force personnel discharged between 1947 and 64. And this is great that we learned the lesson that forensically you want to keep medical records better, but basically they had all sorts Mm -hmm. of blood, all these blood samples, all this stuff got lost in in the sauce in that fire. And so they can't do it. But yeah, I don't, I don't really know where I was going with this round. I guess when I was reading no, the story, I think, it's, it's interesting, though. I think it's interesting because, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously, if you go back to the Civil War, I don't think there's anyone still pining, waiting to find out, you know, there's just those people are just not alive anymore. But, but still, I, you sure. feel like it's worth it to find out who they were and I give agree. proper due, you know? Yeah. No, 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 I agree. So if they have the means to do it and they're not going to disrupt anything and, and not be disrespectful to any of their remains and they're doing it in such a way that is very respectful, then I would support this because I do think not even necessarily closure, but just knowing, you know, knowing that that person served and, and, and died honorably, I think that would go a long way for a lot of families. And I think even if you never met the individual, just to know that that person existed in your family, I think could be a source of pride for families. So good on, good on the scientists on this. Week. Yeah. Good on the scientists. I, there's not, there's not really anyone doing anything or debating anything. It's just, I just thought it was interesting that there's, you know, efforts with the DNA to <laughs> my no, greatest cool. belly. That's yeah, okay. like I it. think it's cool. I think it's cool. But we can move on to the next round. Welcome to Kate having a mental breakdown on Zero Blog 30 because she doesn't sleep anymore. Uh, but I still won't. I still everyone's it's like, kind of oh. like it's kind of like you have a hangover, isn't it? It certainly is. That's so funny. You should say that because that's round number three, Captain Cons, mm. which is brought to us by the folks at BetterHelp. Uh <sighs> Kate could use some right now. I certainly, honest to God, I really could. Uh, go to betterhelp.com slash zero for 10% off your first month. The best way to think about therapy is through a bunch of analogies. So we get our cars tuned up to prevent bigger issues down the road. We do chores regularly, not me though, to avoid a mess in the house. Going to therapy is like all the above. It's routine maintenance for your mental, emotional wellness to prevent bigger issues down the road. Therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you're investing in yourself to keep your mind and body healthy. And Barstool Sports agrees they're offering better help services to their employees as an added benefit. You better believe I'm taking advantage of it. My God. Uh, They're customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So if you're like me and you're looking like that, that meme of that like little rat bat thing that has hair sticking up and it's like, Uh, you don't have to use the video chat. You could just talk to them on the phone. If you want to see someone in person, it's kind of like a zoom chat kind of thing. And it's much more affordable than in-person therapy. You can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. You invest in everything else. Why not your mind? That is a great question. Uh, Betterhelp.com. Listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash zero. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash zero. Each E. Yes. Each E.com slash zero. And on to, I'm not hungover, but I do seem like it. Question, what's the most hungover you've ever been? 
So I, you know me, I'm usually in the mornings, I can bounce up, bounce back, no hangovers. And I'm blessed like that. Thank God for making me Irish. But my cousin's bachelor party, New Orleans, I sucked down, I think, eight hurricanes. So just, you can imagine, that's just basically a sack of sugar that I Mm -hmm. put into my body. I woke up the next day and I'd never experienced that type of pain with how bad my head was splitting. And we had one of those, fan boat alligator tours the next day mm. went on the alligator boat my eyes were closed the entire time i didn't see a single alligator that's, i can't that, believe that you bad. i can't believe you even went on it that's a nightmare yeah yeah it was terrible it was the worst experience in my life yeah man well nick do you are you do you drink at all yes i do um, yeah. <laughs> Um, worst while, hangover. While, while I seem clean cut, um, you know, <laughs> I've, I've had my fun back in the day. I, it was actually, it was, um, the day it was Halloween. I went out, um, I was dressed as a pro wrestler naturally, um, naturally shocking, no surprise to anyone. And I remember just waking up like in my bed, full, just full outfit on. And I had to go to the giant game and we were tailgating. It was a one o'clock game. And my my buddy was calling me from outside and I woke up in a complete blur and I remember he was, everyone brought something. So I made, I made bruschetta, which for anyone out there who doesn't oh, know yeah. what that is, you know, that's uh, you know, it's tomato. It's like, you know, uh, with like olive oil and, and mm-hmm. salt and pepper, but you know, you just add extra love, but you have to cut basil into it. Yep. But you got to cut it in at the last moment. You can't let it soak. So I'm there completely blitzed, just cutting basil in my house, dressed like a goon. Yeah. And I'm just cutting this thing with my eyes closed. And I walk outside (laughs) with that. And he's like, you smell like olive oil and vodka. Yeah. And I was like, what time of the year was it? It was cold as shit. Halloween. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, oh, Halloween. yeah. Halloween. Yeah. yeah it was so a snow. Least... St- it was a snowstorm back in like 2012 or something. Dude, like I that. remember that. I remember, I remember that. that. I remember that. But uh, I was just going to say, I think that's better. I think I'd rather be hungover in cold weather than hot weather. Because if you're just sweating bullets, I think that only compounds everything. I fell asleep. Yeah. I fell asleep in a lawn chair with a loaf of Italian bread in my hand <laughs> in, in a giant what stadium a parking lot. What a picture. Oh, yeah. Getting a good base of bread going to soak yep. it all up. Oh, that's me. Good. I've had so many. I maybe Kate had a problem before. Uh, I had so many bad hangovers that were getting worse with age. One of the worst, we have these, I have a big family, so we have these cousins parties. And one of my cousins hosted a holiday party at their house that just got super out of control. Like just, I was just ripping shots left and right. I slept underneath a coffee table that night. And like, I think I crawled under there as a joke, but then I ended up sleeping like 12 hours under it. Mm-hmm. We all had to go to my grandma's for a Christmas party early the next morning. And I go and I'm in rough shape. I also maybe was not 21 yet. So my parents were like, you, you fucking idiot. And in my grandmom's fridge was an old cheese steak and orange juice. Uh, and so I eat, it's like eight in the morning. I eat this cold cheese steak, hoping it'll help me out. And I wash it down with orange juice. We get in my mom's brand new, bought it that week car. I already know and, where this is going. And I, and I vomit cold cheese steak and orange juice. Oh, yeah, no. it was, it was rough stuff. Also in high school, I would be super hungover and then I would have to alter serve on Sunday mornings. Alter serving hungover was the fucking worst. Dude, dude. you were still alter serving when you were old enough to drink. I stopped alter serving after eighth grade. Like once I, I got didn't to have, high school, dang. I stopped. Pal, I didn't have a choice. If, if wow. I was sitting in the pew and the alter server didn't show up, my parents would be like, get up there. You know how to do it. Get up there. You better go. And I'm like, but I'm 17. Fuck. <laughs> anyway, um, I have no, I have so many horrible hangovers, but uh, Michigan attorney general, she had one too. She apologized on Wednesday saying she drank too much booze before last month's Michigan, Michigan state football game. I might be a terrible bartender. Dana Nessel said Nessel told her story on Facebook, even Post when you're the attorney general, maybe you think, ah, maybe I shouldn't. She went to Facebook posting a photo of herself slumped in her seat at Spartan Stadium on October 30th with a Michigan hat covering her face. Nestle said that she had two bloody, the, the story notes, a Democrat. I don't know where I got. <laughs> Nestle, a Republican would never. Uh, Nestle, <laughs> a Democrat, said she had two Bloody Marys on an empty stomach while attending a tailgate party. She joked that as long as you put enough vegetables in them, it's practically a salad. She's not she's wrong. Not, she's not wrong. She's not, she's wrong. not wrong. I always feel good when I drink a Bloody Mary because that V8 juice is so good for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I proceeded to go to the game and I started to feel ill. 
I laid low for a while, but my friends recommended that I leave so as to prevent me from vomiting on any of my constituents, she wrote. Smart, smart. Smart. She also said she was assisted in getting up from the stairs, and then someone grabbed a wheelchair as to prevent me from stumbling in the parking lot. Honey, that ain't two Bloody Marys. No. Oh, no, 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 no. She, she, yeah, she's churching this up. This was way more than two Bloody Marys if you're this ridiculously hammered. That was a uh, that was seven bloody marys. I am human. Sometimes I screw up, she said. This was definitely one of those times. My apologies to the entire state of Michigan for this mishap, but especially that Michigan fan sitting behind me. Some things you can't unsee. There's a man behind her just trying to enjoy the game while she slumped down in her seat. Um but yeah, you know, politicians and booze. Everybody's acting like this is some big thing. Politicians and booze are like peanut butter and jelly. Did mm. you know? Lyndon B. Johnson, he drank so often that his secretary likened his drinking to a robotic arm that wouldn't ever quit. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nixon was known for drunk dialing members of the White House staff. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's hysterical. Yeah. Um, and I think it was him or Johnson on one occasion. I should get this straight. Uh, but one of them called the National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger to shoot the shit about the incoming invasion of Cambodia. And sure, was that's, just completely- that's a phone call that you have drunk for sure. In 2017, New Mexico Governor Susana Martinez was hammered drunk during a holiday party, allegedly thrown for friends and staffers that included partygoers hurling bottles from the fourth floor balcony. George Washington operated one of the largest whiskey distilleries in the country. I didn't know that. At least four books have been written about Thomas Jefferson's wine drinking habits, quite the booze town, and told his top Civil War general Ulysses S. Grant drank too much whiskey Abraham Lincoln said he wished he knew Grant's favorite brand so he could send barrels to his other generals. Yeah. Saying, I, hey, if you get your job done and you're good at what you do, I don't give a shit what you're doing in your in your other time. Booze yeah. it up. It's just tough these days. Obviously, everybody has a camera. So if you are in the public eye in any way, shape, or form, especially as a politician, when you know at least half the population doesn't like you and wants to find you doing something wrong, you're just in a precarious position. I don't understand why she willingly posted this herself. It's not like she got tagged and someone said, hey, look at the attorney general all banged up. She posted it herself. So she's just an idiot for doing that. Why would she you know, make herself the target of all of this harassment now? Kind my of only my only thinking is getting ahead of it because anybody Maybe. who because anybody who ever gets wheeled out of a game has 20 million phones on them recording. Look mm-hmm. at this drunk idiot. Look at this drunk idiot. And people are probably doing that, not realizing that it was uh, their attorney general, you know, yeah. of the yeah. state. Yeah. So tough going I mean, there. Listen, she's an adult. I'm not judging her because, again, who among us has not ever been overserved? It happens. Just, you know. These are the sorts of things you got to avoid when you're in the public limelight and you don't work at Barstool Sports. That's true. That's certainly true. Uh, I wonder, I I don't have too many, there's no embarrassing videos of me hammered out there yet that I haven't put out myself. That's true. Fingers crossed. We usually, you know, we usually keep the phones away when it's, when it's late night in the dive bars. I was at a party once with, I'll say it was with members of the McCain family. And this was way, way, way back in like 20, 2011 or 2012. And they, they had us all put our phones away. <laughs> so, then, you know, so that shit doesn't get out there, which I think pretty sweet. Uh, heading into the next round is an interview with Rocky Sickman, a POW from the Iran-Contra affair. A remarkable story. Let's hear that. All right. Now on Zero Block 30, I'm privileged to have Rocky Sickman, who is a legend in Marine Corps lore. I I think that there's a lot of stories that's been told about him over the years, and he's one that we talk about um, quite often about how to handle adversity with grace and being able to talk to you is is an honor. Thank you, Rocky, for coming on the show. No, it's my honor, chaps. Thank you, sir. So I I wanna get kind of into a little bit of background because you are a family man of family man. You come from one of those families that you had a bunch of brothers and sisters. You have a bunch of kids and that must have impacted you in your journey along the way and, and wanting to go home and see all of your family. Can you kind of talk a little bit about your upbringing, upbringing and the military family that you come from with your dad being a soldier as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chaps, you know, my father served in the Army. Uh, my brother served in the Army during Vietnam. And, uh, of course, my parents taught me three things. Love of family, love of faith, and love of country. 
Uh, I went to a small grade school. I was so honored to raise that flag at the Catholic grade school, St. Gertrude's, you know, and being able to stand out there and pledge to our allegiance. And I was just honored to do that. And my parents had me in parades holding the flag and I wanted to serve our, our country. Plus, I knew that there was more outside of this little town of Crockle that was a population of 50, and that was dogs and cats. And, wow. and yeah, a very small town. So I joined the Marine Corps and I told the uh, recruiter, I, before I do this, I, I showed them a picture of an MSG, Marine Security Guard. I said, before I do that, I want to see the world. And it's 1976, Japs. And uh, mm -hmm. it was one of those things, there was no war. The Vietnam War just ended. And uh, sure enough, I, I graduated in, Quant or, excuse me, in San Diego. I just so happened to be out in San Diego a couple of weeks ago. I spoke uh, to the special training operation there in San Diego. But anyway, graduated, went to Asia for a year, came back. It was 3-4 there, went to 2-8, Camp Geiger, North Carolina, Met on, uh, went on a med cruise. And I met this young girl, and I said, hey, you know, before I get out of the Marine Corps, I want to do this one last gig, and that was MSG, Marine Security Guard. And so <clears throat> I graduated. Uh, there, uh, my first uh, assignment was in Tehran. It was October 7th, 1979, and November 4th hit, and the rest is history. And, um, it, but and those... you kind of have a, a story that's sort of like mine. I, I remember reading a story about you where whenever you joined the Marine Corps, you didn't you didn't let your parents know beforehand. You had already kind of signed the contract and was like, this is what I'm doing, sitting down at dinner and having the normal dinner conversation. <laughs> And your dad was, he did, it didn't really register um, for him right away. It, was I reading that the right way where he was well, like, uh, I, this didn't happen. Right. You're absolutely right, chaps. And, and during that time, <clears throat> I had two brothers, one older, one younger, two older sisters, and my mom and dad. And my father was a concrete mixer driver. My mother was a, a carpet store secretary. And, and it was back in the days when my mother, she, she stayed up cooking while we were all being fed. And my father would go around the table and say, what did you do today? Rocky, what'd you do? I said, I joined the Marine Corps. And he kind of like chuckled and he goes, okay, so what did you really do? And I said, no, I really joined the Marine Corps. And he asked my mother, said, Tony, tell Rocky to tell us what he really did today. And so I said, no, dad, I really, I joined the Marine Corps. And he and just looked at me. And I'll never forget him the morning chaps when I left for the boot camp. I have never seen my father cry. And yeah. I mean, my father cried and my mother, God love her. She just said, you make sure you go to church because someday you're going to need God. And so she was so right. And I, I understood why my father cried, but just for the next 13 weeks. And I was in a situation that little did I realize that they were preparing me for life. Caps. I mean, I never could understand why in boot camp back in 1976, they were teaching us how to clean our clothes with a bar soap, a uh, slab of concrete and water. And little did I realize that those would be things that I would need uh, during my 444 days of darkest days of my life. And isn't that remarkable? The things that we don't even realize that we are getting trained for it. And they and I don't even think a lot of the drill instructors realize some of the methods behind it whenever they're even doing it. Like, for instance, I was just recently talking with a friend about how we in the Marine Corps will do rifle ranges differently than the other branch of services where whenever we're performing on the rifle range, we will be, the Marines are down where the bullets are coming to, like the rounds are coming to us and we're pulling them down. But it's also, you understand what it sounds like when you're getting shot at, because the difference of sound whenever the bullets are coming at you is drastically different than when you're on the firing line. It sounds different. So we know that, and we're trained for that. You're like, that sound is familiar. Oh, the bullets are coming at me. So that's the reason why we do that. And there's so, you know. there's so many things that each Marine has that story. For instance, I told my mom I was going to, I was thinking about joining the Air Force. Then I, then I call her a couple hours later and say, well, I talked to the Marine recruiter and I'm actually going to do that. And she, <laughs> she was upset as well. <laughs> you, know, you know, it is uh, when my parents found out uh, that I was going to Iran, uh, you know, and Iran just started to get into the news in October. But going back to the training piece, you know, the gas chamber. Remember ha having to go through the gas chamber? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll never forget that morning, November 4th, when, you know, the stuff was hitting the fan. And uh, um, I was called downstairs. Billy uh, was down in the basement. He heard them break in. Uh, I ran, broke away from the front door where I was. And 
you're donning your gas mask. You don't even realize you're freaking doing it, chaps. Right. It's, by the time you get out there, I, I can remember, and I mean, this is 42 years ago. I can still remember to this day how my gas mask was just going from clear to fog. Mm-hmm. The fog. I can still hear the breathing of that, all that. But yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And the training, uh, definitely the honor, commitment, uh, sacrifice. I mean, you, God love you. You're a Purple Heart recipient. Uh, and so over 40 uh, missions, you know, and so there's a lot to be said for that. So I thank you. Well, thank you very much. I want to get into your story, though. That's the reason why you're here, uh, not about me. I want to talk a little bit about what was going on in Iran, because there's a lot of our listeners that really have no, I would say, no real idea about what go, what's going on even currently in Iran politically. But in the in 1979, when you were there, in January, their dictator had left. Like they, he, he was exiled and out of the country. And a lot of people don't realize that he needed to come to America to get some medical treatment. And that really set the political turmoil. There was a, a period of time when there was nearly 30,000 Americans that were in around. By the time that you got there in October of that year, it was down to less than 100, right? Correct, about 65, yeah. So you have less than 100 mem- Americans that were there. And so you were captured whenever they actually came over the wall. You were captured in, in hopes that they would have the dictator returned back to Iran so he could face trial. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and let me back up a little bit. It, it's interesting, as you know, President Carter was the uh, president. And it's, uh, it's in the history book where... President Carter, during one of the meetings, asked his staff, when the staff had told him, President Carter, we need to bring the Shah in. And President Carter said, what are you going to do if and, and when the Islamic Republic of Iran takes our people hostage? What are you going to say then when you want to bring the Shah in? Little did he realize that, sure enough, two weeks after he said that, and he approved because he had been asked to bring him in, that's exactly what happened. But uh, yeah, that... That morning of November 4th, uh, you know, I'm happy to tell you, uh, chaps, seven Marines, because there was a total of about 12 Marines, but only seven got into the Chantry. It was an 11 or 23 acre compound. And the Chantry was the most uh, secured building other than the visa building, which was in the back of the embassy. And so we secured that building for four hours, waiting for the host government to come. And, you know, which obviously it never did come. And, and Three days after we were taken, the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, basically approved the, uh, the next uh, 400 and some days of our life. And before we really get into some of the treatment that you endured while you were there, speaking of President Carter, and when you were when you were captured, and you co- after you get back and you find out that President Carter essentially loses the presidential election because of what happened in Iran-Contra. Like, that's what most people would say. The public outcry for that was just outrageous, and he wasn't going to get reelected after what happened in Iran. When you were there, because typically when Marines are doing operations, we're kind of divorced a little bit from the presidency, from the political processes. You just have a job to do. When you were there and captured, did you think, were you bitter or angry towards the president or expected him or wanted him to do more? Yeah, and that's a great question. I can tell you that um, I was on the med cruise in 1978 to 1979. I was in the Mediterranean in January of 1979 when the American embassy was asked to close down. So we were on standby. <clears throat> I'll never forget it. We were on CH-53s. Uh, basically locked and loaded, ready to go in to assist if we needed. And obviously we're turned down because they allowed X amount of 747s in to get them all out. I can tell you that when I was taken November 4th, chaps, I'm sitting there knowing that there's a fleet out in the Mediterranean. The Marines are going to be coming. I mean, I'm sitting there as I tied. We were tied to a chair for the next 30 days. Mm -hmm. One was tied in a bed. I was my, uh, I was tied in bed. It was a uh, Air Force captain. He was at the uh, foot of the bed. My wrists were tied to his ankles. My ankles were tied to his wrists. And that's how we, we sat there. And you're just sitting there thinking, 
what's going on? And I can tell you that I went through every emotion. I hated myself. I hated my government. I hated uh, my stupidity for doing this. And then, of course, you, you sit there after a while and, you know, it's got the, the good guy and the bad guy on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, no, it's not our government. It's these people. And I'm here to tell you, chaps, that the war on terrorism, it started November 4th, 1979, when the Islamic Republic of Iran attacked our American embassy. And they told us this for 445 days. It is not you that we hate. It's your government, but we will use you to humiliate your government. And it's not about Republican. It's not about Democrat. They hate all of our, our, our parties. They just hate our government because of what happened back in 1953, where we uh, basically put the Shah into power. And they continue to teach that. And I'm a true believer, chaps. A Muslim is not born with hatred. They are taught hatred. And to this day, just a couple of days, November 4th was around. And what were they doing? They were burning the flag and basically chanting death to America. I mean, in the city and young Iranians that have never met one are out there chanting death to America. And we wonder why people can wrap themselves with sea floor and go up to a building and blow themselves up. Well, that's what they've been taught. They're going to do that. Yeah. And we've seen the, and not just the extremism that arises from, um, the Islamic religion, but also and, and multiple religions. It really is ingrained from you, from your parents or how you get indoctrinated. And we, we've seen that in Sweden take place and Norway take place where radical right Christians will do the same type of thing. And I, I think that radicalizing religions across the globe is something that it's affected every single, I mean, from the Crusades on, on. It's been a, a right. constant theme throughout human history that we've done that. And I want to go back a, a moment because whenever I got shot, I thought about it a ton about having hindsight bias or, or Monday morning quarterbacking everything. While you were captured in that first 30 days where you were tied to a chair and tied to bed and tied to your the other troops that were there with you. Did you also play, I made a mistake here. I wish I'd have done th this differently and put yourself through that mental anguish as well? Absolutely. Yeah. That morning, um, as a mission of Marine, a Marine security guard chaps is to provide protection to the property, the documents and personnel uh, of the, the inside the building. The outside perimeter is the whole government property. I can tell and I will tell every American until I'm, I'm in the ground that the morning I was in the, walking into the motor pool gate. Did you ever see the movie Argo? Chaps? Yes. Yeah. The movie shows how they came over the gates. I'm here to tell you, I was walking into the motor pool gate just 30 yards away from that gate when my walkie-talkie had recall. Right over the top of my head was the, the camera uh, pointing at the front gate, and I could see them coming over. And I'm sitting there thinking, Shh, we're, we've been had. I run back to the chantry. Billy Gallegos is uh, closing the door. Um, we secure the steel door. Nobody's getting in. Nobody's getting out. And we go back and don our big old flak jacket, about 50 pounds, and our snub nose 38 and our sawed off shotgun. And that's what we had to protect the American embassy, waiting on the host government. And so about that time, Billy got, is downstairs. They're banging on the front door. Plaster's coming from around the door. I radioed three other Marines come, two kneeling, two standing, because at this time, we got the right to defend the American embassy. Right. All of a sudden, in the basement, Billy hears that they've broken in. And you know, I run down there. Again, I'm the closest to the step. I break away, run down. And I get down there, he points. And around the corner, who do they bring, chaps, but four Iranian women in black shadors. And they're using these women to basically push slowly forward, knowing that we would not shoot an innocent woman. We're being screamed, don't fire, don't retaliate, help is on the way. There was no help. Uh, tear gas popped. They basically fled the building. We got up to the very top of the building, uh, to the most secured part of the, the floor. And uh, there, about a couple hours later, they start bringing people that did not make an in chaps. They put uh, a pistol to their head and said, if you don't open a door. So at that time, State Department is on horn with uh, President Carter. He says, hey, it's going to be 18 hours before we get. And so, you know, so many things were learned because of what happened then. We now have reactionary forces. I mean, CENTCOM is created because of what happened in right. November 4th. So anyway, we were told to give ourselves up, but I can tell you for the next uh, 30 days, as I sat there, I wished I would have pulled the trigger. For the next 400 days, I wish I would have pulled the trigger. For the, I can tell you the last 42 years, chaps, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, 
what would have happened had I pulled the trigger? If Billy and I pulled the trigger, shot those unarmed innocent, we would have been ridiculed as the Marines, you know, going down as the trigger happy people. But, you know, you just wonder, it, war would have started then, but everything that Iran has done since then, after they released us, we paid $8.3 billion, they killed 240 Marines in Beirut. The IEDs that were used, I mean, the war with Iran and Iraq started when we were held hostage mm -hmm. in the and Iran knew that they couldn't, you know, beat Saddam Hussein. They knew that we could. And so we fought the war for him. So, so many things. And so I look back and I think, gosh, I, I wish I maybe would have pulled that trigger. So you're right. A lot of things went on. And I think somebody with your perspective really puts the butterfly effect for November 4th of 1979, puts it so much more in perspective than the average citizen would. And I think that looking back at training and how things are done now, and when we look at situations like, I mean, there's movies like Rules of Engagement, and then there's also real life scenarios like what happened in Benghazi. The way that the embassies are guarded and armed now are totally different as well. Did you have any conversations with either your fellow Marines that were the same rank as you, Sergeant and below, or, did, or with higher leadership that you felt that you were in a position where you could be outgunned when you only have snub nose pistols and sawed off shotguns? Oh yeah, yeah. We it, it was two weeks prior to November fourth that we got word that it was going to happen, and so we told them, "Hey, one of three things is going to happen." And sure enough, one of those things did happen. And uh, it was President Carter was so right when he told his staff, "Hey, what are you going to say when it, those people take our people hostage?" And so it's exactly what happened. And can you walk us through, I, I, reading some of the stories, it put me right back in the position of, of talking with people whenever we were in firefights or just being out in conducting combat operations where you really do go through memory by memory of certain events from your childhood. And one of those memories that you talk about that kind of passed the time for you mentally while you were tied to a chair is going through something that would be so mundane for the normal person. And that was just your mom cooking pancakes, right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, those first uh, 30 days, uh, you know, you were in a very dark place and you just, you know, you, you had to go somewhere in a, a happy place. So I elected to go back and as far back as I could, and I can still remember touching the window of, the, of my room uh, we used to have a lot of snow back then. It doesn't seem like it snows that much, but I can remember the windows being frosty, but I could smell my mother's pancakes in the other room. And I got up, put my, my clothes on, walked in, and I looked through the little island um, divider uh, from the, the hallway to the kitchen. And my mother used a, a skillet, um, a square little skillet, and she had poured four you know, batters. And I can just remember those pancakes bubbling and she would turn them upside down and she got a piece of butter and put a piece of butter on each one of those. And she put them onto a plate and I, she took them over and put them on the table. And I opened up the syrup um, container and took a spoon and I poured the um, maple syrup over top of it and I, and I ate them. And, you know, cause the very first 30 days, you really, when you're in a situation of a traumatic situation, I mean, you're, you don't know if you're going to live or die. I mean, not only those 30 days, but the next 400 days, you didn't really feel like eating. I mean, you just, you wanted this to end, but in your head, you're eating her pies. Thanksgiving and Christmas, I ate her homemade bread, her turkey, her dressing. Um, she made homemade ketchup. I mean, all those different things. You just, you relived it in your past just to bring you back to a happy time. I can remember getting my, my first uh, race car set, I thought that I wasn't going to get my dad from around the corner, pulls out this special surprise, and here's my race car set. When I was a little kid, probably in fifth grade or so. Um, but yeah, it's those memories, like I said, love of family, love of faith, and love of country were the things that kept me alive. And when you finally did get to come home after 440 days and you got to see your mom and dad again, were you able to, how soon after you got back, were you able to talk to them about your mental processes and how you went through things and how 
essentially something that I'm sure your mom didn't think anything about from your childhood of making you pancakes, how that well, could have really saved your mental health. Yeah. You know, it probably, it probably was stages when I came home, but I remember telling my mom, because uh, there's a picture of me coming home and I had a, a cut a yellow ribbon. They wrapped the whole yellow ribbon around the house. And I remember cutting it and trying to walk into the front door while they had the door locked. So we had to walk around the back of the house. But I remember just getting in there and my mom had already, she had begged. Um, Jeff, do you have children? I do. I have two kids. So imagine how, and this is what I look at because I have three kids now, but what my poor parents went through. I mean, how do you, knowing that one of your loved ones, your children are being taken hostage in a foreign country, how do you wake up every morning get ready and go to work and act like you're really going to work when you are sitting there thinking of them. I mean, my parents, they had the media live in their yard for 444 days. It was the biggest news around the world. And, but my poor mother, what she would do is she would cook. She would bake just to keep herself going. You know, that was her release of, uh, of going through. And they just, they wanted, they wanted me home. My mother uh, put her Christmas tree up in 1979 and she kept that Christmas tree up until 1981. When we would die, she would send my father, Virgil, out to the, uh, the field to cut another tree because she just knew I was going to come home. God love her. My gosh, man. <laughs> Sorry, that I, I just cannot imagine, like putting it in the perspective of my own children and hearing stories that, I mean, honestly, there's one that's going on now with the young gentleman, Austin Tice, or not a young gentleman that is captured and he's in Syria and being held hostage now. And he's been there for six years. We've, I've been fortunate enough to interview several other prisoners of war as this show has gone on, where I talk, I've talked to Charlie Plum, who spent six and a half years in the Hanoi Hilton. I've talked to a, a gentleman named Robert Sweat, who was shot down over Germany and was captured there dealing with something like that because you know now that your mom was still bringing in the christmas trees that they were still keeping your memory alive and i'm sure that you had no doubt about that while you were there but one of the troubling parts to me and it hit me emotionally when i was reading your story was the idea that you were sitting in one of these chairs that you were in a dark room but you could hear the traffic going around you and understanding that the economy of iran was still going on the world of iran the civilization was still happening in your mind, you want to believe that everything is paused, but you didn't have that luxury because you could hear essentially another form of torture that the world was going on without you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, those first 30 days. And, and I also, I thought about the Vietnam veterans, chaps. I mean, when my brother came home during the, the Vietnam, the first thing he would do is race home, take his uniform off. People didn't really respect people who mm. served our country. And you know, it, it, it's so, it was so sad. And so here I'm sitting there thinking, I'm 10,000 miles away from home and nobody remembers the first 65 people that were killed in the Vietnam War. There, there were many that were killed. So who's going to care about 65 people 10,000 miles away from home? And like you said, you sat there through the broken windows. You could hear the city of Tehran start and it would peak the traffic, the horns and the demonstrations of death to America, and then all of a sudden it would die down and there would be day one, day five, day 10, and you're sitting, sitting there thinking, you're going to rot here, and you were hoping, I mean, you were praying that, you know, Thanksgiving, a humanitarian, humanitarian gesture, nothing happened. Christmas, humanitarian gesture, nothing. And New Year's Eve, something's going to happen, nothing. And then you were put into a room where I spent the next 400 days in a room I went outside probably a total of seven times out of 444 days. And we were locked in that room. I mean, it was so eerie and was so hard to maintain a positive, you know, respect, but you had to keep faith. And there was this one picture of this uh, in my head, my girlfriend that I had just met right before. And so just like the movie Castaway, he had a locket. I didn't have a locket, but I had her picture. And she was my helping to drive through and, uh, and hoping that I would someday get home and see her. And you said that you hadn't been with her that long. And obviously 444 days is a long time with no contact. I mean, now we look at deployments, even from when, when I went, we didn't really have, you had Skype, but it, you couldn't hardly speak to anybody. Like the internet connection was terrible. You didn't have any talk at all. 
Did you also have to battle the demons of she's going to move on eventually? And this person that's essentially keeping my sanity of who I want to go home and see and spend some personal time with whenever I get back, am I ever... Is she feeling the same way? Were you going through that too? Absolutely. Yeah. Especially when we hit the second Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. the second Christmas, the second New Year's. I turned 23 and excuse my language in that shithole. Yeah. I mean, bad. Uh, and I'm sitting there thinking this beautiful girl is going to be gone. But thank goodness she did wait. And we've been married 40 wonderful years. And I can tell you, chap, she's... Uh, She's the best thing. Uh, if it wasn't for Joe, I'd be in a, I'd be in a, a ditch somewhere. Uh, mm-hmm. She's just, uh, she keeps me on track. And I've heard you refer to her as your, your not only your spouse but also your psychiatrist, your psychologist. Oh, your absolutely, she's yeah. your everything. And I, yeah. I think, and I think looking back with how how many kids you have and grandkids, you've seen them past the age that you were whenever you were captured. Does it ever blow your mind, hindsight bias, looking back at it and thinking, my kid is 23 years old. When I was 23, I was going through this and then trying to imagine your kid in that scenario and knowing how young they are and how really unwise, because we ask our young military members to do so many things that now as a father with a a, a kid approaching 16 and a half or 16 and a half, I think in two years, you could have been in Afghanistan, like do, like fight. How is that possible at, at that age? At 23, you were chewing, you were biting off a lot more than really mentally you were able to chew. Oh, yeah. It's uh, every day. I mean, and like I said, even as I look back now, because I wasn't a parent, now I'm a parent. And I think of what my poor parents went through. And it breaks my heart, uh, mm-hmm. my poor mother and father went through. And I get very emotional, so excuse me. But, you know, it was, uh, they uh, passed away about 11 years ago. But I remember a picture of them when I left and a picture when I came back, chaps. And they had changed so much. And they, had, which it would have aged me had I had to go through that. So right. you try to tell your kids. And, you know, one of the, one difficult time was when right after the, the rescue attempt, they moved us. Um, and they always seem to put me in the middle, handcuffed, blindfolded. And they, you know, they put you in the back of this vehicle, handcuffed Jerry to the left, handcuffed Billy to the right. We're all handcuffed, blindfolded, and they put a blanket over top of us. So whenever we would drive somewhere, my kids would be, I hate sitting in this chair. I'd always tell them, hey, you'd be a bad hostage. You know, we had to sit there. And so I'd explain. To them, That's so dirty to do to your kids. <laughs> I mean, I do that too with mine. Whenever they complain about getting like a vaccine and be like, oh, you think that shot hurts? You should try an AK-47 <laughs> round. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's cruel, but you know, you bring it back. It's, they, and it's hard to explain what 444 days were. I mean, right. there's a, a different story every day. And you know, Billy, the guy I spent 400 days with, whenever I see him, he reminds me of things and I remind him of things. And so it's, it's interesting. So when you were getting to, you you talk a lot about the, the first 30 days. When did it, did you ever get to the point where you were almost broken, where you thought this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my life? Like my life is going to end here. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I said, that first Thanksgiving, that first Christmas, that first New Year's Eve, um, and then, of course, we were allowed to be into a a room with two other people. Uh, During our interrogations, you know, one of uh, the Americans broke during an interrogation and put uh, seven State Department people and uh, military people in solitary confinement. Thank goodness I was in a room with two other people, which helped, you know, pass the time, but it was that second Thanksgiving, that second Christmas, um, when we weren't going home, that you really just, man, you just did not see the light at the end of the tunnel. And it got to be the point where you would walk out and when they would allow you, and you, you first knock on the door, you knock on the door, put a piece of paper underneath the door. And then if you knock uh, correctly, they would take you to the restroom. If you didn't knock correctly and you knocked too loud, they tell you you have to wait. And so you have to do it in the can. And so they would come um, blindfold us, take us to the restroom. And, uh, you know, the ones that really 
for the cruel ones, they uh, drop you or make you fall over a table or a chair and they would laugh. And that's why I said, you know, on November 4th, 1979, Americans were humiliated and just, you know, in a situation that was so disgusting. And so you would come back from the restroom and they would push you into the room. And as they push you into the room, you'd take your blindfold off and push the door back open. The guard that took us to the restroom would never be armed. It was the people out in the hallway. And you would push the door open and walk out and all these guys would come with their weapon. And you would take the weapon and put it in your mouth and say, you know what, pull the trigger. I don't care. And it was, it was sad, but you got to that point, chaps, that you just, you, you just couldn't do this anymore. And that's why I, I think they had to lock us in a room for 400 days. I mean, lock us in there, just like a freaking animal. And I tell my wife, I, I hate going to zoos at times because I, I myself as that animal in the zoo uh, at times. And so, um, but yeah, that was, that was probably uh, one of the darkest uh, and most uh, humiliating um, and tough, tough times to, to go through. And that makes me think of a story that I recently read that there is a, a think tank out of Washington where one of the gentlemen who runs that was talking about looking at the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and thinking about some of the mistakes that we made as a society and how we view service members and things like that. And one of the big mistakes that he thinks that we made was there was a huge impetus put on reunion videos. If you, when you were coming back from a deployment that you were going to show the husband and wives hugging each other, whoever was returning, that you would have these moments and every, everyone gets emotional. And we've all seen those mantra or the dogs and you go home and your dog's going crazy to, to see you. But we don't often show the gold star mother that has to meet her son or daughter in Dover coming off the plane draped in, a, in a, an American flag casket. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't show those things too often. We also see whenever prisoners of war reunited with their families that there's a happy moment and obviously and, and rightfully so that you're finally reun re reunited. But we don't see those moments of how you begin to recover your life because it's I imagine that it's not just leaving a room after spending 400 plus days in there and then everything is totally fine. When you got back off the plane and you re we were you were reunited with your now wife how hard was it for you in a time period where we didn't put a lot of focus on mental health or counseling and things like that? How did you end up be becoming the man that you are now? And every time I've heard an interview with you or read an interview with you, you're so gracious and so kind and so humble. How did you get rid of that bitterness and fear and, and anxiety or did you? No, I don't think uh, it's, it, this is my story. And like I said, um, after finally being released, you have to understand it's January 20th, 1981. Um, we're blindfolded as they take us to the airport. They unblindfold us at the airport. They push us onto an airplane. They start closing the door and you start looking around and saying, well, wait, where's, uh, where's Chaps? Where's Gene? Where's Kurt? Where's Debbie? Where's Judy? Where's everybody else? And they said, no, you're the last. We said, what are you talking about? There's not 65 people here. And they go, no, the others were like, oh, a year earlier. We didn't know that we were the last of the 52 Americans remaining there because you couldn't leave them there. And so at that point in time, chaps, and then you start hearing stories of eight people and you talk about uh, the fallen, the gold star families. We didn't know, I didn't know that eight people lost their life. We'd heard that there was a rescue, but we didn't really know what happened. And so I can tell you, I, I think of that, but when I came home, uh, you know, being in a quiet environment. I, I can't stand that. I got to have noise. I got to have, you know, uh, noise going on every morning. You know, I take a shower. You know why chaps? I can't. Can. Yeah. It's the first freaking uh, two months you had to take a bird bath. I mean, and sometimes I even take two showers a day because I can. I walk outside and just sit there and look at the sky because I can. I can go up and get an ice of cup, a cup with ice because I can. So all these things, it's, it's one of those things I can tell you every morning I wake up, I, I think of those eight individuals that paid the ultimate sacrifice, their life for my life. And never again, and this is where, you know, re working for Folds of Honor provides scholarships, chaps, to families of fallen and disabled military. 
And when I came home, I was able to marry my wonderful uh, bride. We have three wonderful children. Those guys lost all that on the morning of April 25th. Never again would they be able to go fishing with their son, kick a ball with their daughter, um, play lacrosse with their other daughter, walk them down the aisle in a wedding, hold their grandkids. I've done all those things. And, and so it's a heavy freaking burden. And so you don't ever lose that. And I, I, I am very upset that our government continues to try to negotiate with Iran when Iran is so wrong. But Iran, you got to give them credit. They know that our government changes every four to eight years. They just got to negotiate through and then we'll change new administration, new people, and then uh, people will have to start over. And we, we forget their radical belief has gone on for seven, for 42 years. It's the people that took us are in the administration in Iran. So it, it, it hurts. And so you never forget it. I hate to say it. And that's where my good wife, she's my psychiatrist. And she says, Rock, this is what you need to do. Because she knew me before and she knew me after. And being able to have that sense of really support system is something that is invaluable. I have it as well. And we constantly encourage people to have that have that support system because without it people that go through horrific events wouldn't be the same i i sat down with um woody williams who is the last living marine medal of honor recipient from um world war ii and he was a he operated a flamethrower on iwo jima and i asked him kind of the same line of questioning where we talked about what he dealt with mentally and he said that he felt like for all the, the thousands that died on Iwo Jima, that he felt that he owed them to live life in a way that honored them every single day. That, if, that okay. freedom is something that we cannot take for granted. And the sacrifices that pays the check for that freedom is something that we can't look past. Do you ever have a sense of, I don't want to say survivor's guilt, but really survivor's guilt where you look back and you think, why did I make it and some of the other people didn't? No, absolutely. I, I think of that every day. When, when I feel like I'm having a bad day and the man upstairs, you know, my faith has really uh, taken me and helped me through that uh, by many different things. But uh, I can tell you, uh, not too long ago, I worked 34 years after I got out. Um, and I can remember a psychiatrist talked to all the Marines when we came home. And the, the psychiatrist told us there's going to be two ways that you're going to deal with this. One way you're going to keep it inside and never talk about it, but something's going to cause you to break. Or the other side is going to be a way that you use it to talk about and make it through life. And so, and I have, I think that's the direction I have been going and using at, as a stepping stone. Um, because not too long ago, I had to catch a 6.30 flight in the morning and I'm running through the house, uh, going crazy. I go to a convenience store. I get a banana, breakfast, bar, and water. I go to pay. I owe $4.44. And I look at that number and I, I, mm -hmm. I say, you know, God, you're right. I would rather be catching a 6.30 flight any morning than being held hostage. I mean, my worst time was when they put us up against the wall and put, you know, rifles to the back of our head and thought you were a dead guy. So if I can make it through that, chaps, I can make it through anything. And so, but yeah, for me, for Folds of Honor, it's the therapeutic piece for me to give me a driving force to continue on. Where many of my buddies, um, when they came home, committed suicide. I mean, it's one of those things that's keeping me busy and it relates back thinking of what my poor parents went through, but what the 1% of our population that serves in the military right now, and they have families. And so I, I think of them as if it was my parents that what they're going through. This this holiday season, every holiday season, I toast to drink to all of our military as I'm going to toast this Veterans Day to all of them that uh, that serve because we wouldn't be living in this great society if it wasn't for them protecting what we currently have. No doubt about it. And the last thing that I, I want to ask you is this concept of being a lifelong Marine. And it's something that General Neller had, had really spoken to me about when I met him at a NASCAR race. And I had a lot of regrets for the way that I got out of the Marine Corps and how I wanted to continue on my career and make a positive impact with, with junior Marines that were coming up. You are living that 
as being a lifelong Marine and trying to improve the lives of those around you and understanding the sacrifices that you've already made for the country. When you look at the idea of being a lifelong Marine, what is something that you feel like you are almost have a calling to do for this community? You know, that's a great question. I can tell you, I have been blessed. Um, um, the Marine Corps uh, has uh, kept me in the loops. I have spoken to Marine embassies. My son and I went to Cairo, Egypt uh, three years ago, spoke to the embassy there. Uh, and then in 2020, during COVID, I spoke to the Far East, the Caribbean, American embassies via Zoom. Last week, uh, yeah, it was last week, I was in San Diego at the Special Training Operation Command. I then went to MSG on Thursday to speak to the Marines. And I mean, I'm all over the place, but you know what? I want to make sure that every American hears the story of those eight individuals that had the guts to try. I want to use another word, the word, but I can't do that. To get it correct, but the guts to try to come over to rescue us. And, you know, for you to think that nothing's going to happen, I never thought anything was going to ever happen to me standing post in an American embassy in Tehran, but it, it did. And, you know, it's a standing thing that uh, it's never going to go away. And so shame on me if I don't get up and, and work hard to do what those 80, 90 some guys did that flew throughout the night to try to come in. They made it in the desert one to attempt to come over. I need to make sure I attempt every day every morning, every noon, every night to make sure that everybody knows, as you said earlier, freedom is not free. And we need to make sure that we thank those that uh, protect our freedom each and every day. And I think one of the best organizations that's doing that is Folds of Honor and the way that you're looking out for the people who need it most, the people that have, the family members of those who lost their lives or those who have been severely injured um, along the way. So I want to thank you not only for your service to the country and the Marine Corps, but what you're doing as an example afterwards and being able to really follow the Marine Corps mantra of improvise, adapting and overcoming. And that is, it's something that we can spit out, but something that you have embodied over the last 40 years. Rocky, thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you. And again, uh, Semper Fi, and thank you for serving our country also, Jeff. Semper Fi. The holidays are coming up. Everybody's getting some yard work done to put up the lights. You're trimming your bushes and you can do the same with Manscaped. This holiday season, I'm giving thanks to our friends at Manscaped. Do I tell my extended family that I have the performance package for one now? This is for chaps. But actually, I have something to admit. Pat has it and it's in our shower and maybe I used it recently. So whatever, I do have it. Uh, the Performance Package 4.0 from the global, global Leaders in Below the Waist Grooming, not to mention it includes their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer to tame my bush and score brownie points with the in-laws. Gift yourself Manscaped or the man in your life who needs it. Join Pat definitely does. He is one of the hairiest men alive. Join the 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with 20% off plus free shipping with the code zero by going to manscaped.com. Promo code zero. Great interview there, and on to saved rounds, cons. Okay, let us see here. What do we have in saved rounds? Uh, interestingly enough, talking about movies at the top of the show, right now, do you remember when we interviewed Chicky Doo from The Greatest Beer Run Ever? Yes, I do. And when I interviewed him, he said they were making a movie. Well, it got recast. Now, Zac Efron is pay playing him. Ooh. Bill Murray is in it, Russell Crowe is in it, and they've been filming in Jersey City. So they've been filming in and around the area. Uh, I've been seeing a lot of pictures of that happening. Efron's rocking a awesome 70s mustache. So oh, yeah, that's hopefully awesome. Hopefully when that comes out, we'll get Mr. Donahue back on. Maybe we'll get Zach and, and see if Bill and, and Russell can come too. I don't know. We'll see. We'll give it a whirl. That'd, be, yeah. that'd work out pretty well. That'd be sweet. Yeah, um, I saw a thing, and I'm, I'm interested to get your thoughts about how these soldiers who suffered traumatic brain injuries from an explosion are being denied Purple Hearts. Obviously, Chaps has a Purple Heart. We know Purple Hearts typically are exterior wounds, and it's a no-brainer. If you suffered an exterior wound, you're going to be awarded the Purple Heart. But what do you think about wounds that you cannot see? Traumatic brain injuries, PTS. What do you think about providing 
or excuse me, providing, awarding a Purple Heart to those individuals. Because also, it's, it's more than just awarding them the Purple Heart. There are a lot of benefits that come along with having a Purple Heart uh, for them when they leave the military. So I'm just curious what you think about that. Um, t- I think if TBI, if there's medical documentation of it, then it's a no brand, no pun intended. It's a no brainer to me to include that. That's what I think about that. Just plain and simple. Um, I think, yeah, that's, all. I mean, I, I think, <laughs> no, I think, listen, I think if, if the VA recognizes it as, as, as a disability, then I think it should be eligible. Now, granted, you'd have to go back and retroactively award a lot of people purple hearts, but I think it's something worth considering and something mm-hmm. worth discussing. So if you can prove that someone was within, within the range of an explosion or a blast or something like that. And yeah, and there's proof of TBI, then yeah, I don't see why not there are other yeah. stuff. I, I don't know. It's a, it, it, I can understand how that would get tied down and messy and confusing. So I don't know, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and then my last question for you, I was asked yesterday how I feel when people say thank you to me for, for Veterans Day and, and how I feel about all that. And I was just curious what you think when, when people say thank you or don't say thank you and, and all that. Um, I don't care ever if people don't say thank you or anything like that, though. I did keep a list of who didn't text me on Veterans Day. No, just kidding. Same, same. Um, no, definitely not. But boy, am I glad I called that guy. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I don't mind. And I think when people say thank you for your service, like some people say, oh, it makes you feel so good. Just, you know what it is? It's People just want to do something nice and say something nice. They don't always know what to do or say, and they just want to do something. So just say, that, that, oh, wow, thanks very much for saying that. You know, like, yeah. that's all you got to do. Don't make it a big thing. Just be appreciative that people are trying to show their appreciation. Right. Um, yeah, it, is I, awkward. it is awkward for some people sometimes. They don't, like, know how to act or what to say. And, and you know, I do appreciate it, but I also don't think differently of people if they don't say it. Yeah, no, don't say God, it. That's, no. That's fine too. Because I was thinking about it too. And, you know, my service for me, it's, it's more about me reckoning with that inside myself and, and, and being proud of that myself. And I'm, I was reminded, I'm sure many of our listeners have heard uh, George Patton's speech to the third army during world war II. And like one of the last parts, it kind of sticks with me when people talk, ask me about serving and how I feel about that. And if they care, if I, you know, they say thank you or whatever he said, uh, then there's one thing your men will be able to say when this war is over and you get back home 30 years from now, when you're sitting by your fireside with your grandson on your knee and he asks, what did you do in the great world war II? You won't have to cough and say, well, your granddaddy shoveled shit in Louisiana. No, sir. You can look him straight in the eye and say, son, your granddaddy rode with the great third army and a son of a goddamn bitch named George Patton. Now, granted, I didn't serve with George, George Patton, but that's kind of how I feel about my service. Like I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. That's what I did. And, and I'm proud of that. And that's enough for me. So anything extra, any thank yous is just icing on the cake. Yeah. And, I, and even then, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. if you were just shoveling dirt in Louisiana and you didn't go to war and that's cool too. Like I, I just don't care either way. I just, um, but I, yeah, I just think it's nice thing for people. Um, it's it's like, yeah, I just are on the side of saying thanks and not making it a thing. Um, Anything for, for me, you? Do I have any save rounds? No, I guess I just, I, all I can talk about is baby stuff. I'm so sorry for that, but. Go check out Barstool Heights here. Everyone keeps telling me to do, I keep chickening out on that too. I've been definitely like, honestly, I've been having a tough time lately and I, uh, I just don't feel confident enough to put those blogs out. I just feel like who's, who the fuck cares what I have to say, which also I, makes I, podcasting I think, difficult. <laughs> Kate, so. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people uh, do. There's a lot of mothers out there and fathers for that matter, who do care about that content and, and will appreciate your perspective on it. And I think I don't have children, but everything I've seen from, from you and then from the responses is that you're all kind of in this together. Everyone kind of goes through some, sort of fashion the same sort of things in, in some way or another so it, it really resonates with a lot of people so i would say hit yeah. publish on them as much as uh, I, I as much as much as i talk about my daughter i would talk about her like a hundred times more if i didn't think that i was talking about it too much already <laughs> yeah i just i i don't know and i just like i hit these waves of i think you call it like imposter syndrome where it's like why why am i a like i love my job so much but i I'm like, like, ah, this blog's not funny enough. It's not funny enough. So if you look on the back end of my blog page, I have like 45 almost completed blogs that I just don't publish because I feel like they're not good enough. 
And, and then like next month, I'll be having a good month where I'm like, oh, I'm publishing everything. I feel good. I whatever. But I'm just in one of those like, you know, life ebbs and flows. And I'm just one, one of those times right now where I'm just not feeling really confident. And I'm, I'm, I get down on myself for some reason. I think maybe part of it's that I'm not sleeping at all. Um, I think another part of it's probably hormones going insane. And I think, so I don't know. I'm just saying this on the pod because I feel like we talk about our lives pretty openly. I hope it's not weird, but. No, uh, it's not. I, I think so, you should just start hitting publish because I think people will resonate with those. Yeah. So I've been kind of struggling with that at work lately, which it's crazy because I have like the best job in the world. It's not like I don't like my job. I fucking love it. I get excited to get on the train to go in every day. I'm like, all right, I'm at, it's like Christmas morning. Um, so hopefully that turns around and I can figure that out. Th- thus better help, you know, um, that kind of thing. But other than that, I was super excited for chaps to get out to San Diego. He was texting us all throughout his Marine Corps ball that he was at saying, oh man, Marines are the fucking best. This is the mm-hmm. fucking best. They gave him um, a, a plaque, I think. And he got to give a speech. He said the speech went great. The people were great. And I'm just so happy that he got to do that. It is awesome. And as a reminder for us, we're kind of detached from service a lot of times like I know you go up to West Point for the games and stuff like that but me I don't have too much of a connection to the military anymore besides doing this show and like when we do stuff like when we did the R&R down at Fort Bragg and being around all the troops again was like oh yeah this is fucking sweet like it's just a good reminder so I'm glad he got to get out there and do that um I hope everybody had a good Veterans Day I do hope you got your Applebee's as much as everyone jokes about it I hope you went and got something um, I might go get a 7-Eleven coffee as we're on Veterans Day. Do it. Um, but other than that, I think I got nothing. And that's it for me. Uh, All right. Nick, Nick, you got anything? Yeah, real quick. Um, speaking of Zac Efron, my cousin is a, was a stand-in for him on a movie. So, um, oh, cool. cool. Yeah, so that's, that's my save round. Just a little fact. All right. There you go. I like it. it. Well, that yeah. was... You guys had good ones. I decided to buzzkill the whole show and I will sound the retreat. What a weirdo. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>